right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Megan, did you want to go ahead and give a short introduction from the library prior to me starting? Sure. Um, my name is Megan. I'm an adult services librarian at the Aurora Public Library District. Um, we are very pleased tonight to have the Hope Fair Housing Center here with us to talk about um, knowing your rights as a renter. Um, as I mentioned before, um, this recording of this session will be available um, afterwards on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel, both of which can be found under Aurora Public Library District. Um, there are a couple of other Aurora Public Libraries out there in the United States, so you may need to add the word Illinois, um, <laughs> but we are out there. Um, <clears throat> Thanks very much uh, to the Hope Fair Housing Center for joining us. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, Megan. And thank you again to the Aurora Public Library District. We're really grateful for the partnership between the library uh, district as well as Hope Fair Housing Center. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about your housing rights as a renter. And we're gonna specifically focus on the Fair Housing Act as well as what fair housing law entails. Um, on this first uh, screen, you're gonna notice that there's two photos. One is of my executive director, former Illinois Lieutenant Governor Evelyn Sanguinetti, and me, who uh, is Nafia Khan, and I'm the Director of Outreach and Events and Fundraising. So again, we are Hope Fair Housing Center, and we are the oldest and largest fair housing organization in the state. And our mission is to creating, <clears throat> excuse me, that we are working to create greater housing opportunities for all. When we say fair housing, what we mean is that we believe that everyone has the chance to live in the place of their choice, free from any discrimination, coercion, threats, and intimidation. And that can look like different things for different people. For some, that means that they want to live in their own home. For some people, that, live, that means living in their own apartments. So we really believe in truly making sure that everyone gets the opportunity to live in whatever place they call home. And to that end, Hope Fair Housing Center has a pretty large service area. We, for instance, provide services as far north to McHenry, Joe, Joe Davies, Stevenson, and Winnebago counties, all the way west to Rock Island. We also serve folks all the way down um, downstate to central Illinois in Tazewell and McLean County, whereas on Bloomington Normal, Illinois area. The only two counties in the Northern Illinois region that we do not provide direct service to is Cook County and Will County. Those actually are served through Lawyers Committee on Better Housing, as well as the South Suburban Housing Center. However, we are excited to announce that Hope Fair Housing just recently got a grant and we will be expanding to Southern Illinois as well. So soon you will see Hope Fair Housing Center being more or less the premier statewide fair housing center in the entire country, which, or excuse me, in the entire state of Illinois, excuse me, which is really, really exciting. So to that end, you know, we talked a little bit about what fair housing means, which is fair housing is truly living in the home of your choice, free from coercion, from intimidation, from threats and discrimination. We probably need to kind of delve a little bit back to our past to truly understand our future. So you may or may not be aware, but the United States had in the very, very early 30s, a law that then President Franklin Roosevelt actually signed into law. And that was called the National Housing Act of 1934. And for those that are interested, this was not a law that specifically spelled out discriminatory practices. What it was, frankly, was more of a bare bones bill. And it was to really set up on um, the minimum standards and conditions for housing, as well as providing the creation of a system of mortgage insurance and other purposes related to housing. So this did not cover things like discriminatory actions. This does not co consider things like protected classes. This was more about the general conditions of ho housing and the fact that there needed to be a system of mortgage insurance for homeowners and folks seeking housing. And once that law was passed, there was a lot that occurred as a direct result of that passage. 
unfortunately, many of these actions took place in the negative, and that's what led us to where we're at today, which is needing fair housing. There was the act of redlining, which many of you may have heard that term before. Basically, um, the bank and the lender, the loan uh, folks that are um, approving loans uh, for folks that are interested in buying and purchasing homes, they basically refuse to give loans to folks that live in majority minority communities or folks where there's a lot of um, a concentration of immigrant populations. And this continues, by the way, to 2021. Unfortunately, redlining has only gotten worse. And we're noticing here in Illinois, the many cases that come across our desk, the complainants that call hope, we often have to address redlining often. And then of course, we know in addition to redlining, there is the practice of a restrictive covenant. It's basically a piece of paper that is more or less a legal document that's considered a contract. And it essentially told African-American community members that they were not allowed to purchase, lease, or occupy a home. And it was specifically uh, covenants and contractual agreements that were in fact discriminatory against black Americans, no other community. And then in addition to redlining and restrictive covenants, as if that wasn't bad enough, then we saw the increase in contract buying or what we refer to as predatory contracts. There was lots of unfortunately loopholes and other caveats that folks used to basically bypass any sort of protection or any supposed protection under the National Fair uh, Act, Fair, excuse me, the National Housing Act of 1934. And that was where things were predatory. And basically predatory contracts were contracts that essentially told the folk basically that purchased a home that they couldn't receive the title to that home until they made that last monthly payment. If you think about it from the perspective of a home buyer, it's really a good faith effort, right? It's a relationship, it's a relationship built up between the buyer, the seller of the house, the mortgage lending company, and then the folks that are actually providing the mortgage, which is banks. So instituting something like a predatory contract is really a quick way of discriminating against certain communities. And unfortunately, those predatory contracts often fell into the hands of minorities and that specifically entailed black Americans who were purchasing homes. So that was a very often um, long-term, a you know basically a long-term legal binding document that made it impossible to really truly enjoy own home ownership. And then of course the big one, which is discrimination. And we know that this is still a huge issue today. And this is frankly why Hope Fair Housing exists. And discrimination is, as we know, when you're treating somebody unfavorably based on their class or their group or which uh, category they belong to, or as we refer to perception. So the people is, the person is perceived to belong to. We always include this map of Chicago in 1960 to demonstrate something really unique. As you'll notice, there is on, on this legend, uh, two different dots and they indicate either white community members or black community members. And as you can see with this map, the racial distribution of the city in the suburbs in 1960 was not that much different than it is right now to this day, which is, is that predominantly African-American residents and black other black and brown communities resided in predominantly west and south side of Chicago, as opposed to the white residents that typically took um, out, out on the suburban locations, as well as the north and east side of the community. And this is just sort of a reminder that this is what the racial distribution was back in 1960. And if we compare this to 2021, we will notice that black and brown community members are actually predominantly residing in these same communities. That is the west side of Chicago and the south side of Chicago. It's just another reminder of our roots and how important it is to know our history. So at this juncture, we've learned a little bit about the fair housing law, the very first housing related law, excuse me, the National Housing Act of 1934. And we learned a little bit about the discriminatory practices that occurred as a result of the passage of that law. Now we're gonna be moving into other important civil rights moments. And we refer to these events under the Chicago Freedom Movement. And the reason this is called the Chicago Freedom Movement 
is because these events were all taking place here in Chicago, Illinois, right in our backyard. And it also happened to be the culmination of what was part of the larger civil rights movement. Uh. So three really, really important events that we always talk about in our presentations for outreach have to do with Dr. King. And this started all on January 26th, which is when the King family actually moved to the West Side in an apartment. And really what the, what the mission of this move was to highlight the end slums campaign that the King family and the larger um, African-American community in the country was calling for, which was the end to slums in the city and in it, especially in Chicago. So they actually physically lived in an apartment to showcase that campaign. Then halfway into the year, you had July 10th, 1966. Dr. King was actually asked to attend um, a, an event, basically a demonstration. And he, along with several other mar marchers, placed a physical list at the door of city, Chicago City Hall. And one of the key asks as part of that list of demands was the ability of making sure that Black Americans, and specifically Black Chicagoans, were able to get the same real estate listings as their non-Black counterparts so that they would have the same opportunity to take on home ownership goals. So that was a very important, important step as part of the Chicago Freedom Movement, especially when it related to housing rights. And then of course, we know the very pivotal moment on August 5th, 1966, when Dr. King was actually struck on the head while leading a march against housing discrimination in where, as you can guess, an all white district in Chicago. And the, these three events are so crucial. On top of highlighting how prolific Dr. King was when it came to the civil rights movement as it related to housing discrimination, this is really, really impactful because all of us have been shaped in some form or fashion as it relates to housing discrimination and being protect, protected against some of that discrimination. It all started with the Chicago Freedom Movement and it all continued to culminate itself as the civil rights movement continued to unfold. So lots of love and lots of memory to Dr. King and his family for being a part of the reason that we experience housing discrimination protections to this day. Now, this is where we get really interesting. The Fair Housing Act of 1968. Shortly after Dr. King's assassination, the United States underwent an extreme, extreme trying time. The biggest thing that came out of the horrible tragedy that was Dr. King's death was the need and the necessity to move forward and end some of these discriminatory practices. And housing was one of the largest one of them. And that is why through lots of political will and a lot, a lot of advocacy, President Lyndon Johnson finally signed the Fair Housing Act of 1968 into law. And this, folks, was the largest effort to actually put in place in legal legislative measure a prohibition on discrimination. And this includes discrimination as it relates to rentals, leasing, purchasing of home, selling of a home, and any occupation of a dwelling because of a person's membership in a protected class. And this is where it get, things get very interesting. We now know that the Fair Housing Act of 1968 was passed shortly after Dr. King's assassination and his sad and tragic and life-changing event, which was his death. And that is where we have to learn a little bit more about why it's so crucial that the fair housing laws to this day protect us. What is fair housing? It's the right for all people to live where we choose, have access to housing, enjoy the full use of our homes. And that means we fight at hope, at hope against unlawful discrimination, interference, coercion, threats, and intimidation. And when it comes to protected classes, there are several different kinds. And under the fair housing law, which is on the left-hand side of your screen, are our federal protected classes. And the federal protected classes include sex, disability, race, national origin, 
color, religion, and familial statuses. Something unique that we would like to highlight recently, thanks to the Biden-Harris Biden administration, under sex, we have also expanded that to include sexual orientation and gender identity as federal protected classes. We're really excited to hear that because that means more protection for more folks. And that means anytime a complainant calls us and is seeking some sort of um, assistance in a fair housing discrimination um, situation, then we can actually advise them because they are considered federal protected, protected classes if they belong to those groups. Additionally, we have in Illinois, we're very, very fortunate. We have a very strong sense of responsibility as it relates to civil rights. We have very unique Illinois protected classes, which include ancestry, sexual orientation, marital status, gender identity, age, and yes, folks, that's not just over 50, it's over 60, order of protection status, and military status. Something we're especially proud of here at HOPE is the intersection of housing discrimination and any other community members. So for instance, folks that are survivors of domestic violence often have to take out order of protections against their abuser. It is a very common call that we receive at HOPE that people are being taken and given threats on their life or their safety because their landlords don't want to live, have them live in their complex because quote, all abusers do is return to their, uh, excuse me, all abused women do is return to their abusers. That's not true. And that's actually a discriminatory statement. And we take it very seriously when a survivor of domestic violence is calling our line and needs some clarification about their rights. Illinois is only a handful of states that includes order of protection status as part of their protected classes. The other one that I found really important was for veterans, and that is the military status. Believe it or not, because veterans do not receive what we refer to as like a pay stub to show landlords their pay, they often get turned away from housing, even on their housing choice vouchers. And we know how difficult it is for veterans that are returning from their service to find that they're unable to find basic necessities like housing, like affordable, clean, safe, accessible housing. That is a huge, huge community, especially right now with Veterans Day coming up, that we like to remind people that yes, military members are often discriminated against when it comes to housing. So we're really lucky in many ways in Illinois that we benefit from a lot of these laws that have over time adapted to the times. So I'm just really grateful to be working for an organization that not only supports folks that can be members of the federal protected classes, but also members of our Illinois protected classes. So really quick, I know a lot of folks wonder, if I am experiencing discrimination, what should I do? Well, really quick, you definitely wanna make sure that you have some kind of un understanding of what the issue is. So that when you call Hope Fair Housing, again, we take intakes from anybody and everyone in any community within our service area. We want to know basic demographic information. We're really gonna take down information as to what occurred, if you have any documentation, any documentation or any forms or any information that we can use to process your story. We then decide, is this something that is a violation of the Fair Housing Act or any other local and state law? And that's when we decide whether we're gonna refer you to another entity to handle your case, or if we're gonna take, on, take it on at HOPE. And that is when, if we decide to take it on, that the issue gets sent to the complaint committee. We have a group of staff at HOPE that are referred to as the enforcement staff, and their job is to take the information that was collected at intake and determine the next course of action. And we then decide if we're either going to test or we're not going to test. If we decide to test, what that means is just like a secret shopper, we will send folks as part of our trained testing team to basically go in 
and gather potential evidence of fair housing violations. We do this in a really professionally trained and coordinated way through the lucky staff here we have at HOPE, our testing coordinator, uh, June, and our director of enforcement, Josefina, and our um, attorneys and our other folks that are part of that committee, they determine if we can go ahead and actually bring one of our testers in to gather in for information in this covert testing method to be able to determine if there is a fair housing violation happening. If we decide not to test, we may have to take some interviews or some information from some property um, websites. We also may have to conduct some interviews from witnesses, folks that are um, experiencing certain patterns of uh, different treatment. And we also collect other evidence and we submit that to be analyzed. So we did all the testing and we're now in the process of analyzing the evidence. If we have an informal resolution, that means the staff and the person complaining and the respondent all come together with some sort of resolution. If that works out, that's awesome. We want things to be taken care of. But if things get really, really nasty, as in we need to go to court over things, we do go through filing an administrative complaint and look at legal remedies. That is where we also go through and have to take things to the point where we have to do, do conciliation, which basically means that once somebody has been um, given the opportunity to legally file a fair housing complaint and are successful in that, we have to hold that other entity accountable. So often as part of a conciliation agreement, we ask that the, um, the entity, like say for instance, we have property management company that discriminated against a um, black renter because of the color of their skin and didn't rent to them. We often have to um, inc include in that conciliation agreement that they will provide ongoing training on top of paying hope to do those trainings. So just a little overview of what happens when someone contacts hope. You're probably wondering, okay, we went through the history of fair housing. We went a little bit through the protected classes. Why is housing so important? Well, it's because it's affecting every part of our lives. The kind of food you eat, the sort of clean air that you breathe in, the access to good schools, the access to public transportation and shopping centers, for instance. Also access to clean water, good health care access to clean and safe and accessible parks, emergency services, and heck, the most important part, employment opportunities. Every bit of our lives is impacted by housing. And now we're looking at some trends as it relates to fair housing today. That is, what is happening today that is impacted by fair housing and housing policy related to discrimination? So this is where we talk a little bit about disability and reasonable accommodations. Many of you might know this, but the law as part of the protected classes includes people that are peoples with, people with disabilities. And we always define people that are covered as somebody with a covered disability as someone who has a mental or physical condition that substan substantially limits one of, or more major life activity. So for example, that could be breathing, their vision, their ability to hear, being able to speak or perform basic self-care tasks, or they could have a discriminate, they could be experiencing discrimination, discrimination based on the perception of having a disability. So sometimes somebody may actually be discriminated against and they don't even have a written down disability, but someone believes that they may have a disability and as a result, they're discriminated against them. So that's also very important to note. And when we say substantially limit, we're talking about it has to be something that severely limits those major life activities. And there are some people that ask, okay, well, if I have a temporary disability, what happens then? Those are evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis using those same criteria that was just explained. And now this is where it gets really interesting. People in the disability community are protected under multiple different laws. One of the major laws as we talked about earlier is the Fair Housing Act. And that's the one that actually specifically spells out those federal protected classes. 
There's also Section 504, the Rehab Act. And then there's also the most one of the most important laws, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act that was signed into law by, by then President George H.W. Bush. So 1973 Rehab, Rehab Act, it was one of the first laws that actually provided civil rights to individuals with disabilities. It applies to recipients of any federal financial assistance programs. So some of the um, details within 504 that talks about housing says that it covers any housing that receives federal assistance. So if you receive the housing choice voucher, which is sometimes referred to as Section 8 of public housing, that would, would have to subscribe to the, um, the law that is Section 504 of the Rehab Act. And that law mandates that at least 5% of the units that exist have to be designed for people with physical disabilities. And at least 2% of those units have to be designed for people that are deaf, identify as hard of hearing, are blind, or have low vision. And again, per the Architecture Barriers, Architectural Barriers Act, buildings built for or leased to federal government must also be physically accessible. This is just a standardization. And again, these we're talking are bare minimum requirements. Same, the Americans with Disabilities Act significantly changed the course of our country as it relates to similar protections against discrimination as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 did. Some of the areas in which it touches includes um, properties that are operated by state and local governments, and it has to do with any buildings that are constructed after Fe February 26, 1992, which means historical buildings, yes folks, are almost always off the hook which can be problematic sometimes, depending on what the, his the historical building is. So just kind of important to note that the law is not always perfect. Title three says that it actually applies to any public area. It says that it needs to be structurally accessible, any building that's built after February 26, 1993, and you have to have the requirement of reasonable accommodations. And that's when you're wondering, okay, what the heck is a reasonable accommodation? So Can I interrupt just for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I believe the presentation is frozen on our end. Um, I don't think we can see the correct slide. Could you um, stop sharing your screen and reshare and see if we can get that to catch up? Yeah, I'm so sorry about that. No, that's fine. Can you guys see it now? I see reasonable accommodations now. Perfect. So with this in mind, now we're looking at learning a little bit about what the actual physical law talks about as it relates to people with disabilities and reasonable accommodations. And a reasonable accommodation is something that is a policy change or a rule change or a practice change. And it's essentially something that a person with a disability is, is needs in order to fully enjoy that, whether it's housing, whether it's workplace, that sort of thing. And as it relates to housing, it's something that has to be done in order for a person with a disability to have access to it. And in this case, accessible housing. So some of these requests specifically, as you can imagine, come from people with disabilities and are provided to landlords. The housing provider really has to look at the person's disability based on their individual disability and not just a blanket policy for anybody with a disability. And if it's a visible disability, technically speaking, a housing provider cannot ask for any sort of confirmation. Technically, some people with disabilities, especially that have invisible disabilities, sometimes a housing provider may ask for a backup. However, actually, when it comes down to it, it should not be something that you have to show some sort of doctor's note. However, 
especially in the case of things like service animals, it is not uncommon that housing providers or a landlord need some sort of documentation from a medical professional to indicate that the person has a disability that needs that reasonable accommodation. So that's something that we see a lot, especially with folks that have service dog requests. So examples of reasonable accommodations, allowing a tenant with a disability to have a service animal, making sure there's accessible parking, making sure that a person that has a mental health disability, for instance, is able to get medical treatment before they can just get evicted. And you'd be surprised, one of the most common reasons that folks with disabilities contact our office is because of service animals. And the other often dispute that we have is in fact over accessible parking spaces. And I was actually very surprised at this very third one. I would have never thought that folks would just get evicted willy nilly, but there are in fact landlords and property managers that often are pressured to bypass any sort of uh, reasonable accommodation request and go straight to trying to evict folks with mental health disabilities. However, that's where hope comes in and we're there to protect folks. This is just an example of what a document would look like if you're looking at a reasonable accommodation under the Fair Housing Act for somebody. We often will ask people to make sure that the documentation includes exactly what the law says or specifically highlight why they need the actual uh, reasonable accommodation request of an animal. As you can tell, the body of this specifically says, as stated in the documents for medical professionals att attached to this letter, this specifically highlights the section where somebody with a disability can actually indicate that they have been evaluated by the professional in order to receive that reasonable accommodation request. And again, very important at the very bottom, it specifically says, please reply to me within a certain number of days. I think it's really important to remember that especially as a person with a disability, folks will find unfortunately any old way to throw out reasonable accommodation requests. And it's so incredibly important, especially when it comes to your rights that you document, document, document. Because if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. Just an important reminder for folks that are interested in requesting reasonable accommodations. Um, just really quick, I don't wanna to spend too much time. In January 1st, 2020, the United States, or excuse me, the state of Illinois just recently revised what we refer to as the Illinois Assistance Animal Integrity Act. And basically this law actually talks about disability related needs for the assisted assistance animal and others that um, are supplemented with existing laws. Basically what the document, this legislation says, excuse me, is that you have to have a document coming from someone with a therapeutic relation. That means that somebody has to either be like a medical professional or somebody that's seeking some help from a therapeutic uh, professional. It's also saying that in order to combat those online businesses, because yes, folks, there are online businesses that are now trying to certify emotional support animals. The act, it actually this law requires documentation to come from somebody that's actually assessing the person. It's also um, reminding that landlords are not gonna be held liable for injuries caused by service animals on their property, basically holds them harmless of that. And also it asks that landlords can ask for documentation if there's more than one animal that's being requested, like an emotional support animal. So just something to keep in mind, as we do know that people with disabilities need service animals and we need to make sure we're not violating the law. That being said, we always wanna make sure that we corroborate both federal law and state law and make sure we find that medium. Okay, so we got through reasonable accommodation. What's a reasonable modification? Well, a modification is basically something that allows at the expense of a person with a disability a reasonable modification or a change to their existing home. So in this case, somebody that wants a reasonable modification, they want an installing of uh, grab bars in their bathroom. That's what we would refer to as a reasonable modification. Widening of a doorway for accessibility or installing wheelchair ramps. These are all referred to as reasonable modifications. We did not install a, uh, a wheelchair ramp like my boss says with a bunch of bedazzled and glitter and sequins. We just made sure that there was a ramp that was accessible for the person. 
We weren't going to get uh, bejeweled and bedazzled bathroom grab bars. Nope. We're just making sure that that person can get in and out and can hold on to something safely while they're in the shower. Okay. So we've covered a lot already tonight, folks. We've gone through the Fair Housing Act. We talked a little bit about the protection it offers. We also spoke to um, some of the very specific guidance um, in federal laws as it relates to people with disabilities. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about those discrimination cases. So there's two different types of discrimination. There's this thing we call overt, and then there's differential treatment. Overt discrimination would be someone blatantly in front of you without any regard, treating you differently, excuse me, unfair treatment because you are a member of a protected class. And then there's what we call differential treatment. And that's more of the subtle unfair treatment of one person compared to another person based on their membership in a protected class. You're probably wondering, okay, that sounds great, but what does that look like? Well, when it's a fair housing violation, it has to be a protected, prohibited act against a protected class for it to be illegal discrimination. So if we use that formula, an overt example would be refusing to rent to someone, which is a prohibited act, because they have children, protected class. That would be they were the protected class under familial status. So in this overt example, Someone is refusing to rent to someone because they have kids. That is the overt example. However, the differential treatment is what we call differential treatment because in this example, it's basically discouraging somebody white from purchasing a home in a minority majority neighborhood because the schools aren't good, but then not saying anything to the buyer of color. So keep that in mind. In this case, it's they're treating the white buyer, home buyer, differently than they're treating the buyer of color. They're telling that white buyer that this is a not a neighborhood that they wanna be in because the schools aren't good, but they're not saying anything to that home buyer that's a buyer of color. And while we're on the topic of differential and overt treatment discrimination, we also wanna talk about something that's called disparate impact. And disparate impact is often tied to housing discrimination. And that's a policy that seems like it's not good or bad, but when it puts, when it's put into practice, it actually has a greater negative impact on one group more than another group. And one that we often choose is people, just as an example, say for instance, the landlord only rents to people with naturally blue eyes and not brown or hazel. So say for instance, in this example, the landlord would only rent to people on the left side. You see three different celebrities on the left, and then they would not rent to the people on the right-hand side if we're looking at naturally blue eyes and not black or brown. So that's kind of a, like a less, um, it's like kind of a, it's, it's a pretty discriminatory, uh, very, very discriminatory practice. Because in the end, what happens is it also leaves out black and brown community members in that whole um, ability of being able to use, utilize market housing. Criminal records. We know that in the United States, people with criminal records are not technically considered members of a protected class, but there's additional civil rights laws that are on the books that protect people that are experiencing discrimination because of their criminal record status. And there's two different kinds. Remember we talked about this? Discriminatory treatment, that's where a criminal record is used for the race discrimination or it's applied inconsistently. And then the disparate impact are those facially neutral policies that have that disparate impact on racial minorities. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this one case that is a very important one and it's called Fortune Society versus Sandcastle Towers Housing Development. So basically, Sandcastle How, uh, Towers Housing Development is a group of property, is a property group, and they're basically, um, they experienced, they were actually dis discriminating by having a blanket ban to rent to people with criminal records. And in this case, uh, there was a challenge on that blanket ban because it was, in fact, <clears throat> making these bans disproportionately and overwhelmingly impacting African-American 
African-American and Hispanic renters. The owner would automatically deny admission to anyone with a criminal record, regardless of any of the factors that would determine if the person was a serious threat. One thing that help fair housing always talks about is that blanket bans can be very problematic. And the reason for this is we know that when you put a blanket ban on something, you're not evaluating the merits of that specific instance. Folks that do things like create blank blanket bans on renting to certain people with criminal records are not taking into account the kind of crime that person has on their record. Was it a charge? Was it a conviction? Because certain convictions, as we know, will come with specific um, consequences. And often if somebody has not been formally um, convicted, and even if they have been convicted, as we know with times, the laws change and instances stay the same, unfortunately. So we have to really make sure that we're protecting people's civil rights, that we're not discriminating one group more than we're discriminating against another. And frankly, if we're discriminating at all, what's going on in that pattern of behavior? And really, why is it that these policies are being passed? Is it to, to help make society freer? Or is it helping it so that certain people stay in jail longer and certain people are dealing with uh, a hard, hardships that other folks don't have to deal with? Some problematic criminal record practices we see often, ones that have no time limits. We can often see in language where you're looking at rental applications, they say things like a history of criminal activity, excuse me, the crim history of criminal history by any household member, or these blanket bans that never house anybody with an assault or bodily injury charge. Unreasonably long look back periods. So seven years for bouncing a check, shoplifting, public intoxication and other misdemeanors. Or a minimum look back period, a minimum of five years. And then of course, unclear starting points. This is a very common practice for people that have just criminal records. When they talk about your arrest versus, versus a conviction versus a release. If you're just going to tell somebody point blank, because you have a criminal record, I'm just gonna not even look at your application. They have to be very clear in the language that landlord or that property management company has to be very clear in the documentation because otherwise they can get in trouble with civil rights violations. So there's um, just a couple of scenarios I wanna run through, but then I'll probably wrap this up soon. Um, situation one, is this illegal or is it unfair? And anybody can, um, if anybody is here, just kind of think, think, think about what, what your guess would look like. A landlord refuses to rent to lawyers because they don't trust them. That's not really illegal, but it's definitely unfair. A landlord refuses to rent a three bedroom apartment to a family with two adults and four children under the age of 18. Well, in this instance, they're talking about family members. And because we know that familial status is a protected class, this would be considered illegal under the Fair Housing Act. A tenant with disabilities is evicted after falling and breaking her hip. Her landlord cites that she is a danger to herself and should not live alone. I would be very careful to say um, whether or not that person should be evicted um, or kicked out, frankly, that she should not live alone. Um, the fact that this person has disabilities, um, we could easily see that if there's a pattern where this landlord specifically is, um, you know, kind of singling her out as opposed to other tenants that may not have a disability, then we could maybe show that cause that this person is specifically being targeted for discrimination because they have a disability. So this could, depending on the situation, be illegal. A property manager advertises kids welcome and gives preferences to families with children. So technically, this is where familial status is really important. A property manager advertising kids kids welcome and give preferences to families with children. Technically, this is <clears throat> not necessarily illegal. This might be unfair 100% against people I don't have kids. Sorry, those that don't have kids. Um, but technically, this is not illegal under the Fair Housing Act. A landlord fails to maintain a building where most of the occupants are African-American, but has another building 
which is in a suburban neighborhood that's well maintained. The, occup <clears throat> the occupancy of the other building is about 80% white and 20% of African American. The landlord claims a difference in maintenance is only because the tenants in the first building do not pay rent on time. Um, I would probably, I, I don't think that we can necessarily say this is just unfair. Um, there, depending on the pattern of this behavior, if this is a pattern that this landlord and this property management um, entity that has done this previously, this is a pattern that can be you know, shown over time that this has been the case, then it could potentially be landing in something on an illegal, in like the legal realm of needing to be uh, looked at in court. So I would definitely um, not say that it's necessarily unfair, but it could be potentially illegal based on the other merits of the case. A landlord charges a higher security deposit for families with children because there will be more wear and tear. We have heard these situations happen a lot, especially for folks that are calling Hope Fair Housing Center. It is not uncommon that people say things like, oh, well, I need to charge you a higher security deposit because you have kids. Again, although that they're at this very minute, it almost sounds like it's an unfair policy. It, we may or may not, again, depending on other aspects of the case, we could potentially look at some of this. It definitely, however, does is 100% an unfair policy because it's putting um, the folks that are in the protected class, which is people with children in a place where they're being charged a certain higher rate. And the, the thing with um, security deposits and um, uh, like deposits when it comes to housing for rentals, it's completely different, kind of like a game show. Uh, I mean, it's like, um, it's, it's kind of like a, like a, Kind of like a, a look of the draw. Um, often we are able to negotiate, you know, advocate on behalf of a um, of a complainant who believes that they're being charged um, higher security deposit for specific things. But it's definitely an unfair practice, 100%. And a landlord requires a blind tenant to live on the first floor for safety reasons. Um, this would have to be evaluated um, because, first of all depending on that person's disability, um, and in this case, they indicate that it's a blind tenant, everyone's disability is unique and everyone's disability um, is the, spe the specific uh, reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications that are requested are unique as well. So a landlord can't just say things like, well, all blind tenants can only find a place on the first floor or, oh, only all uh, people with disabilities that um, apply for housing here have to live in specific spaces. 100% if it's a reasonable accommodation, um, that is completely different if the person requires that, um, ask for that reasonable accommodation. But for a lease to specifically highlight that if you are blind, that you have to live on the first floor for safety reasons, that's 100% delving into the illegal space. And then finally, a landlord asks an applicant who receives social security disability payments, what disability the applicant has in order to determine whether the tenant needs a reasonable accommodation during the application process. I personally don't believe, and I know this for a fact, you should never, ever, ever, ever ask somebody about their disability. You do not need to tell them, you do not need to tell anybody what your disability is in order to go through the process. So that being said, this is where we have to come in as Hope Fair Housing and advocate on behalf of our complainant, because that is 100% getting into the illegal kind of activities. Super quick, um, I wanna make sure that we cover current, um, current events. So just to kind of sum up so far, we talked through the Fair Housing Act, we talked through protected classes, we went through a little bit about each of the instances where people with disabilities would wanna talk about reasonable accommodations and how to do so, and how to talk through reasonable modifications as well. And we talked about the laws that protect people with disabilities. And now are some of the instances where we see housing discrimination. We have these things that are popping up everywhere in this country, and they're called crime-free ordinances, but they're also referred to as what we call anti-nuisance ordinances. What they do is that they say things like, for instance, this requires the landlord to evict tenants who place 25 calls, number of calls to emergency services within three months. So it's basically something that is local governments have passed and made into an ordinance, like into a local law that is supposed to cut down on nuisances. However, we know that often people that are, for instance, survivors of domestic violence 
are impacted very heavily when it comes to these situations. Um, this is a report uh, actually from um, this thing called um, the, un it's actually a piece called uh, Unpolicing the Urban Poor, it's consequences about third party policing for inner, inner city women in American psychological sociological review. And it's actually a, um, a statement that was made and it said, um, this is like an instance that they talked to about, about a scenario for somebody who's a domestic violence survivor. First, we are evicting Sheila M., the caller for numerous help from police when landlord wrote to the MPD. She has been beaten by her man who kicks in doors and goes to jail for one or two days. We should have suggested she obtain a gun and kill him in self-defense, but evidently she hasn't. Therefore, we are evicting her. And then some of the other, um, you know, cases, you know, again, we see time and time again that people seem to take it upon themselves to make judgments and calls about why a survivor of domestic violence should not be living in specific um, areas because, oh, she's going to constantly call the police on her abuser. And, oh, as the property manager or as a landlord of the site, I don't want to deal with your, quote, drama. That's not reason to kick people out. You cannot evict somebody who is a survivor of violence because you have some sort of preconception that they're just going to never leave their, their partner and it's their problem, not yours. That's completely wrong. And as we know in Illinois, survivors of violence are considered protected class members. Another instance where nuisances are actually uh, completely opposite uh, results um, as opposed to trying to cut down a nuisance that actually creates more issues. The city of Peoria, um, not too long ago, um, ended up uh, taking, we ended up taking city of Peoria to court because they had stationed these, what they called armadillos. They're basically, um, <clears throat> they have these like nuisance abatement vehicle, these like polices, and they're basically stationed within specific um, neighborhoods. We noticed that they deployed these nuisance abatement vehicles in predominantly African-American neighborhoods. And so as a result, Hope Fair Housing created this very important case. And we actually won this suit and we settled with the city. And basically as a result of them placing these um, uh, vehicles in predominantly African-American neighborhoods, they now have had a lot of policy change come out of this case. And for that reason, we really highlight why it's so incredibly important that when any ordinances are being created, especially those that have to do with nuisance abatement, that it is really taking into consideration all the pieces of the community and that in fact, policies don't have a disparate impact. So we come to towards the end of our presentation now. And this is where we're looking at um, the different resources that we can provide once uh, today is over. So we're thinking, okay, this is great information, but what can I do? Well, if you or someone you know is experiencing housing discrimination, please make sure that they have access to our phone number because we are available Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. to take their call. And that's our phone number, 630-690-6500. Additionally, we have this great resource right here in the area, and this is also available 24-7. That's the Housing and Urban Development Toll-Free Hotline. If you contact HUD at 800-669-9777, they'll provide ample information for you and often will direct you to your local regional office number. And that is where we have our third number, which is our local Chicago regional office. And that's located here right in downtown Chicago, 312-353-5680. So those are really important resources that we refer folks to. And while folks are thinking about filing a complaint, because keep in mind, just because HOPE helps people do this, doesn't mean that folks can't um, go ahead and file their own complaints. You can file your complaint with um, HUD, with the Department on Her um, Housing and Urban Development one year after the discrimination occurs or ceases. And with any US federal or state courts, you can file two years after the discrimination occurs or ceases. Another really important um, item to know if you're filing housing discrimination cases. Um, some people that can be held for uh, help and responsible for violations include landlords, housing association, cities, like in the city of Peoria, uh, property management companies, property owners, as well as real estate brokers, appraisers, and other lending institutions. 
building developers, insurance companies, newspapers that publish discriminatory ads, and anybody that is an agent or affiliates if with any of the above. And with that, I just want to say um, a couple of other next steps in case you're interested in staying connected with HOPE. We would love to continue um, engaging with you. So anytime that you're interested in doing a presentation or maybe you want us to come speak at your event, um, if you belong to any community groups, you can do that. We also have an online volunteer and intern form. If anyone's interested in being um, a paid tester um, that we talked about earlier with our testing program, you can absolutely sign up for that online. And you could also join our listserv. Same thing, if you just um, include your information on that volunteer online form, you can also join our listserv. And we also uh, invite you to follow us on all of our social media platforms. And just uh, reminding everybody to stay in touch um, in case you are interested. I will make sure that I share this um, with Megan and everybody at the library in case you guys are interested in staying connected to us after today. Thank you.